aspects of probiotics for enhancing gut performance. A couple of caveats first. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on functional benefits of probiotics. So I'm going to give some examples of that. I'm not in any way claiming that all probiotic applications or the use of all uh, products that are claimed to be probiotics will induce these types of benefits. Um, I'm going to focus on finfish. Uh, sorry to ruin that after we had that nice introduction about probiotics for shrimp. Um, and I'm going to, as I say, func focus on the functional aspects rather than the different types of probiotics. So I won't necessarily mention all the strains that are used in these studies, or I may not mention the dosage and so on. Before we get to probiotics, though, we first have to remind ourselves about the gut microbiota of finfish. The whole point of why we're using a probiotic is to modulate, hopefully to modulate those microbial populations in the intestinal tract. Uh, so first of all, we have to look at those microbial populations. In finfish, we know they consist of archaea, viruses, protozoans, yeasts, and bacteria. The most abundant populations are, now let me see if I get the right button, no, are, there we are, the bacteria. Bacteria are by far the most abundant and diverse component of this community. Uh, although yeasts, of course, are rather large cells, and the fact that they are there at a one or two log scale lower than bacteria uh, may be made up for by the fact that those cells are slightly larger or quite a bit larger than bacterial cells. And, of course, they contain lots of functional things like beta-glucans and manoligosaccharides and so on. So they're likely to be important components of the microbial community. Uh, just as in the case with terrestrial animals, these microbial communities in fish may be alloctonous, so present here within the lumen, or they may be autochthonous, so in close, um, close association with the epithelial cells, as you can see here with some types of microbes in close association with the brush border in the intestinal tract. So as I said, most research has focused on um, bacteria because they tend to be the, the largest component of the, of the community. Um, they can yield populations within the intestinal tract of up to 10 to the power of 8, colony forming units per gram of intestinal tissue, which is several log scales higher than what we might expect to find on the gills or on the, on the skin, and indeed several orders of magnitude higher than what we would expect to find on the feed and in the rearing water. Uh, however, that's just scratching the surface. Once we started to look at the non-cultivable communities as well, we realized that when we're doing these kind of plate count stuff, we're only finding 1% or less in, uh, in many cases of fish of the total microbial community. So we're talking about maybe 10 to the power of 11 or 10 to the power of 12 cells per gram of intestinal material. So what's that, 100,000 million cells. And to give that some perspective, this is a fluorescent in situ hybridization image of the intestinal microbial communities of rainbow trout. And all of these types of structures that you see here um, that look like rod-shaped uh, cells or circular coccoidal cells, these are bacteria or archaea that are present within the intestine of, of the rainbow trout in this case. You can see lots of uh, background staining, some fluorescence of the mucus and the semi-digested feed. But if you just look at the relative surface coverage area of that image, maybe 30 or 40 percent of that is microbial cells. So if we think about the mass within the intestinal tract, maybe 30 or 40 percent of that mass is actual uh, biologically active microbial cells. Or well, most of them are probably biologically active, which is not too different than what we find in mammals. These are also very diverse communities, so from um, DGG-based methods or other classical DNA fingerprinting-based methods, we thought that those communities consisted of dozens of OTUs, or operational taxonomic units. Uh, and when we started to use next-generation sequencing technologies, we realized actually we were off by quite a bit. There are actually hundreds of different types of strains present within the gastrointestinal tract. And this is just for the bacterial communities, not to mention those other components. So very diverse, very abundant communities. And we know from lots of different studies conducted in various fish uh, species, particularly really exciting research done with germ-free and notobiotic um, experiments, that these microbial communities are integral in aiding host development, particularly at the larval stages. Uh, so the absence of uh, microbiota, uh, fish fail to develop their gastrointestinal tract properly, the functionality of the gastrointestinal tract is retarded, and so on. They're also important in terms of stimulating immune function or maintaining tolerance, uh, regulating stress. Uh, they're influential in aiding nutrition. 
um, and important in uh, aiding disease resistance as well. Now, I'm not going to talk about too many of the different types of microbes that we expect to find or the, the bacterial species that we expect to find in the gastrointestinal tract of fish, but we will just mention very briefly the lactic acid bacteria, uh, which predominantly, with one or two exceptions, are considered to be friendly components of the gut microbiota. Um, and we find lots of the same types of species that you might expect to find in terrestrial vertebrates uh, and one or two differences. So the Carnobacterium species, we won't expect to find those in terrestrial vertebrates, but we do find them in cold water fish species such as salmonids. Um, bifidobacteria, obviously very important in mammals, not so important in fish. Um, we hardly ever find them, and when we do find them, they're at a fraction of 1% of the total community. Uh, so not very important, we don't think. Lactic acid bacteria in general can be, as we found in this salmon study that we conducted very recently, uh, account for maybe 30 or 40% of the total bacterial community. And other studies have uh, revealed that they may be as high as 80 or 90% of the bacterial community. So they are important. But of course, not all of the microbes in the gastrointestinal tract are friendly or potentially beneficial for the host. And this is another fluorescent in situ hybridization image. And here we have used a fluorescent probe that shows the Eremonas and Bibrio species, which are in green, fluorescing green. And all of the other bacterial cells and uh, indeed the archaeal cells as well are fluorescing blue. And again, if we look at the ratio of green to blue cells, maybe it's, I don't know, 20%, something like that. And these were healthy carp. This is a sample from the intestine of healthy carp. So even in healthy fish, we can get very high populations of potentially opportunistic pathogens. But the fish has evolved um, an extensive network of defense within the intestinal tract. So just to look at that very quickly to see how the fish will defend against those types of microorganisms and how they will also interact with other types of microorganisms. And these are the types of things that our probiotics may influence. So what do we have within the intestine? We have these columnar epithelial cells, these enterocytes. They do have microvilli. They do have a brush border on the surface, but I haven't drawn that on here, so you'll have to imagine that, pretend that you can see that. Um, within those folds, those mucosal folds, we have some loose connective tissues with capillaries. We don't have lacteal vessels. Fish don't have lacteal vessels in their uh, mucosal folds, which is one of the reasons why we don't call them villi. And the first layer of defense against pathogens or indeed uh, any types of microorganisms within the gastrointestinal tract is the mucus layer. And the mucus layer consists of glycoproteins and within fish, the most important ones in the intestine seem to be MUC2, MUC2-like and iMUC. And they are produced by these goblet cells that you can see here. And this transmission electron micrograph shows these packets of uh, mucins that are just about to be released onto the surface. And that provides a mechanical uh, and physical barrier against those pathogens and, and indeed all types of microbes um, and can bind to them and wash them out as that mucus is continually turned over and removed. But the mucus layer also contains a number of antimicrobial proteins, um, things like uh, beta defensins, piscidins, complement proteins, lysozyme, and indeed immunoglobulins as well. Uh, so there's a lot of IgM present in the mucus, although it doesn't seem to be the, the main important um, antibody in the intestinal tract. It gets degraded relatively quickly by the enzymes, uh, pepsin and trypsin, and the harsh acidic conditions within the gastrointestinal tract. So the most important immunoglobulin in the intestine is IgT, which is analogous to IgA in mammals. Uh, and when that's secreted and transcytosed across that epithelial membrane, um, or across those epithelial cells, rather, uh, secretory protein goes with it, which provides some protection against, um, against the harsh conditions in that digestive tract. And then there are lots of different cell types as well, lots of immunological cells present within the, the intestine, um, predominantly within the epithelial layer, within the lamina propria and the submucosa as well. And those of you that are familiar with the intestinal tract of mammals will realize that we don't have payers patches here in fish. It's not that I just forgot to draw that, but fish don't have payers patches, and therefore they don't have the B cell and the T cell follicles that you would find in the payers patches. We're not sure if they have M cells. They may or may not. There's some evidence to suggest that they might or have M-like cells. Um, and so what we believe to be happening is that we have uh, macrophages and cells that look kind of like dendritic cells or have den uh, dendritic markers. And those will be selectively tasting antigens uh, outside of the, beyond the epithelium. 
Um, they will then be presenting those antigens onto naive B cells and T cells. And fish have both CD4s and CD8s in terms of T cells. Um, within the CD4s, they have T regulatory cells, TH1 cells, TH2 cells, TH17 cells. And also recently, TH22 cells have been identified as well. Uh, granulocytes are present, and mass-like cells are present as well. Uh, so you can see the fish has quite a robust uh, immunological defense within that intestinal tract. It's much more diffuse than in mammals. It's not structured and ordered. Um, and fish don't have, as I say, the lacteals. They don't have uh, mesenteric lymph nodes either. And there are lots of different types of microbes in the gastrointestinal tract, so there's a lot of crosstalk and a lot of interaction between the host and the microbial population. So it can be quite difficult for the host to maintain mucosal tolerance. Um, I don't want to go over this too much, so take a picture if you're interested in looking at this. Uh, these are just different types of microbes that have been used uh, as probiotics in fin fish studies. Shameless plug of that book there, which you can buy if you like at all good bookstores. Uh, so those are, those are the types of things that are going on in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, but so what? What happens when we provide a probiotic in the feed? Do we get colonization within the gastrointestinal tract? Um, more often than not, yes. There are lots of studies that have revealed probiotic populations in the gastrointestinal tract of probiotic-fed fish, particularly in the intestine, where most of the activity is going to be taking place. Some of those populations are adherent to the mucosal epithelium. Some of them are stuck within the lumen. Some of these studies reveal populations that account for maybe 80 or 90% of the microbial community. Some other studies show them present at 1% or less. Uh, in all of those cases I've just mentioned, you can still find host benefits. Um, it just seems to be with different probiotics used at different dosages in different fish species and different feed types and so on. We have lots of variables that account for different levels of probiotic modulation of that microbial community. Likewise, um, the... There are some studies that show increased abundance of microbial populations when you feed probiotics, some that show decrease, some that show increase in diversity, some, some that show re reduced diversity, and so on. So lots of different variables, too much to try and summarize everything uh, in terms of what you might expect in terms of modulating the microbiota. Uh, so, okay, we can get some of the probiotics in there, that's fine. What are the mucosal benefits? Well, some of the things that we've found, uh, if we look at that mucus layer again, the first layer that those microbial populations will be interacting with, we can see from a number of different studies, and I'm just highlighting some of them here as examples, but there are many others as well, that with, with the application of probiotics, we can reduce and retard the adherence of pathogens to mucus in in vitro studies. Um, we can see that with feeding probiotics, we can increase the abundance of goblet cells in that mucosal epithelium, uh, and they're therefore inferring that we're getting increased mucus production. Uh, and there are some studies that have shown elevated lysozyme activity of the intestinal mucus of probiotic-fed fish. Uh, and then if we look at the brush border, I did tell you there was a brush border. Now you don't have to imagine it. This is what it looks like. Uh, so if we look at the very surface of the apical um, surface of those enterocyte cells, we can see a brush border. In several studies, uh, quite a few studies actually, we can see with the application of probiotics that that epithelial border, that brush border, the microvilli height is increased with probiotic applications. You can see that here in this study with rainbow trout and in this study with sole. Um, significant increases in microvilli height compared to the control non-probiotic fed fish. We also saw some indications of increased endocytic activity as well in that study. And if you look down on the surface of those mucos mucosal folds, we can look at the microvilli density, looking at them from above. And there have been a number of studies that have shown that probiotics can improve the microvilli density. So we can see these microvilli on the surface of the enterocytes are more densely packed. Uh, if you have densely packed microvilli, more microvilli on the surface of the enterocytes and longer microvilli length, then we have increased absorption area or potential for increased nutrient absorption because we have elevated surface area. Uh, and this, uh, these... Uh, micrographs don't come out very well, but you can see in some cases that there are increases in mucosal fold length as well when we use probiotics. So again, increasing surface area for nutrient absorption. A number of different studies have shown that with the application of probiotics, you can stimulate increased intestinal digestive enzyme activities. I won't bore you with all of these, but there are some interesting studies with the use of bacillus species that can show increased cellulase activity, um, and chitinase activity, phytase activity, and so on. So some of those important enzymes that the fish cannot produce itself. 
Uh, if we look at those mucosal folds, we can measure the number of intraepithelial leukocytes as well as the um, goblet cells. And in this study, we looked at three weeks and six weeks after feeding a probiotic to tilapia. We looked at these mucosal folds. And we can see after six weeks, we had significant increases in the level of intraepithelial leukocytes, significant increases in the abundance of goblet cells, and also significant increase in the pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF-alpha. Um, this just illustrates some sort of time-dependent type of effects, that you don't see these types of effects after three weeks, so it takes at least three weeks before these types of effects start to manifest. And that's quite similar from morphological studies in various different fish species fed probiotics. It usually takes, from what I can tell in the literature, at least two or three weeks before those benefits start to manifest. So four, four or five weeks normally is the earlier time points that we look at now. Um, in terms of molecular responses, the gene expression might be a bit quicker, which makes sense. It would be these types of genes, that, such as TNF-alpha, that would be acting to recruit more of those leukocytes from the systemic bloodstream uh, and getting that to the mucosal folds. Uh, similar other studies that have looked at uh, that have, we have used and looked at for um, the abundance of goblet cells and intraepithelial leukocytes, and we saw here again, actually, uh, with the Biomin product, the Aquastar, that we got significant increases when we used the product at three grams per kilogram in the diet for tilapia. We got significant increases in goblet cell levels and intraepithelial leukocyte levels, uh, but just again indicating that uh, dose is important. We didn't get such benefits when we used uh, 1.5 grams per kilogram. Again, we got similar benefits in terms of the gene expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the intestine. They were increased and upregulated. Uh, and simultaneously, we also see, saw increases in anti-inflammatory gene expression uh, levels as well. So perhaps preventing an over-excessive inflammatory response. Um, so what, you might say, all of those things sound nice. Do they actually provide a benefit to the host? And we have seen in a number of different ex vivo studies where we've removed the intestinal tract of probiotic-fed fish, and we've then exposed them to pathogens, and we've looked at the level of pathogen damage. Uh, and here you can see uh, we use Vibrio angularum, and we use the strain of Pediococcus acetolacticae. We put those in those ex vivo intestinal sacs. And you can see the types of damage here, the loss of membrane uh, integrity, um, uh, necrotic enterocytes, some sort of intracellular spaces as a response of the Vibrio angularum in the intestine. Um, and this is what it looks like under scanning electron microscopy. So looking down at those mucosal folds, you can see some irregular cells, and you can start to see the gaps in between those enterocytes and um, making those tight junctions available for the pathogen to go in. In the fish that were fed the probiotic previously, we didn't see those types of that level of damage. So there's some level of protection afforded to the fish from the probiotic feeding. We've seen similar results in uh, sea bass with Bacillus subtilis as well. And I can see my timer is counting down, so I'm going to go through some of those a bit more quickly. Uh, one of the interesting things we've been looking at lately is the ability potentially of probiotics to help mitigate against enteritis. And we know Professor Krogdahl's group has done lots of research on characterizing enteritis in salmonids. And some of the very interesting things that her research group found was when you get enteritis in salmon, you get uh, an increase in heat shock protein 70 expressed within those mucosal folds that are showing the enteritis and the inflammation, and an increase in PCNA as well. So we fed sea bass a very high soy protein concentrate diet that we spiked with saponins, and we found that that led to enteritis in the sea bream, um, no, sorry, in the sea bass. And you can see that here. We have very short mucosal folds, not looking particularly healthy. With the application of the probiotics, we saw the increased uh, mucosal fold heights, the increase in surface area. Uh, and then when we looked at some of those molecules, this time the gene expression rather than the proteins, uh, we can see a significant reduction of heat shock protein 70 gene expression, caspase 3 and apoptotic uh, marker, and PCNA, all significantly decrease in the probiotic fed fish. Uh, compared to the fish that were fed the soy-based diet with the saponins, but without the probiotic. Uh, we saw similar benefits with prebiotics and a combination of probiotics and prebiotics as well. There's some indications there of mitigation against that uh, enteritis. Uh, again, in separate studies, we also looked at the um, same types of diets, and we used scanning and transmission electron microscopy to look down at that brush border. And again, you can see the loss of um, 
sort of um, membrane integrity here, you can see blebbing of these mucosal um, microvilli. Um, so th these sort of blobs that are hanging off the end of these mucosal folds, that shouldn't really be happening. That's happening because of the saponins. Uh, and when we look at the brush border of the probiotic fed fish that were still fed the saponins, we don't see that blebbing. And again, with the scanning electron micrographs, we can see a higher quality membrane uh, microvilli integrity. So the drawbacks of probiotics, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, is stability and viability. So particularly during the production process, the addition to the feeds, we have to do it at the moment. We have to do it post-extrusion because most of the microbes will die pre-extrusion if we add them then. Transportation is an issue, uh, you know, getting that stability of those probiotics on the, on the feeds during transport and issues with shelf life, depending on how you store your feeds. Survival through the gut is often low, although we do often recover the probiotics in the gastrointestinal tract. They're maybe only at 10 or 5% of what we actually added uh, in the feed. So a lot of them are being lost in the upper gastrointestinal tract. And we all know about the uh, legislation, um, particularly in the EU, on how we can use probiotics or not. Proof of efficacy is a, is a big deal as well, because as I've explained earlier, I've shown you lots of different studies that have shown some benefits, but for every study like that, there's probably two or three studies where no benefits have been revealed. So, um, you know, probiotics aren't going to solve everything, and not everything that you're told is a probiotic really actually has the types of benefits that we would expect as a probiotic. And in many parts of the world, there are spurious products, as I say. Um, and if we look at the composition of some of the products that are being sold on the market, those microbes that are present in them are not actually what are being labeled on the, on the containers, and they're not always at the same abundance that the seller is telling you as well. So lots of issues that need to be solved, but great potential for improving gut performance of finfish with probiotics. And I think I've just about kept the time. You didn't throw me off the stage yet.